welcome back from Nova Scotia. Yeah, it's uh, it was fun. We were we did a couple of little video shoots out there, and and for this week we spent some time. I spent some time on a, on a dike uh, near Wolfville, Nova Scotia, a massive dike, uh, really really an impressive thing. And what I, of course what I was trying to show you there was that that how impressive it was that these small um, not technologically sophisticated people. They didn't have you know bulldozers and stuff to work with. They're, they're just building these things with hand shovels and so on. The kind of sense of community that that built amongst these people, uh, and it's a really impressive thing. It turned them into successful farmers, um, people who could trade with New England when the New Englanders weren't invading. Um, but you know, it really uh, allowed to develop a prosperous, uh, self-sufficient community uh, that really looked to itself and its own resources as uh, as a way to maintain itself. Just a phenomenal amount of labor to, to yeah. hardworking people to turn that land yeah. arable. Um, Walking up those things is hard. Never mind building. Building it, it's amazing. So, like from this, the readings this week, they're all from the 18th century, mm -hmm. and we're we're learning about um, who the Acadians were and and you know at this time period. But it's actually quite confusing. A lot right. of things happened in the 18th century. So I I want to know like who. Other than these incredibly hardworking people who can convert land to be arable, who are these people? What, like, right. where are they from, and what, how are they viewed? We, we looked at this a bit in the screencast, but just to kind of really summarize the whole thing, they're they're, they're French migrants. Uh, most of them are from Normandy on the, the west coast of France. They they show up in Nova Scotia in the 1640s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and they build farms. So there's a fishing industry there as well, but it's mostly a farming community. Um, but the really tricky part of the story, and where part of the confusion lies, I think, for many people looking at the story, is that mainland Nova Scotia, what's today the mainland, so not including Cape Breton, not including Prince Edward Island, not including New Brunswick, because it was all Nova Scotia at the time. Uh, but when it was a French colony, Acadia, the mainland part of what's today Nova Scotia gets passed to the British after a war in the, in the 1710s. The Treaty of Utrecht passes that territory. So that's where most of the Acadians live, French farmers, but they're now under British rule. Uh, so for that period between 1713 uh, and then the Seven Years' War, 40 years later, um, they're French Catholics living under the rule of British Protestants. And that really kind of situates them in that difficult position. So the British have to figure out what to do with these people. Um, and the key part of that story is that they offer them the right to stay, although it's always kind of in question, but they offer them the right to stay if they'll take an oath of allegiance. So four times the British come to the Acadian leadership and say, if you take this oath of allegiance, you can stay on the land. And four times the Acadian leadership goes back to the people and says to them, you know, that's the offer. And they come back with a, with a reply. And they say, yes, we'll take the oath of allegiance, but we won't take the clause that says you must bear arms in support of the crown. You promise to bear arms in support of the crown. Because that would put them in an incredibly difficult position. Acadians, as you'll see in your readings this week, Acadians uh, in some cases intermarried with the local indigenous people, the Mi'kmaq. So there's close cultural, even family relationships there. So you would in effect be asking, and they're allied with the French. So if a war were to break out and they took this oath, you would be asking them to bear arms against their brother-in-law or sister-in-law or cousin or you know whatever family members kinship community members this would be an untenable position for them to be in so they, they resist and for three times the British say it's okay and the fourth time they don't like the response and this is when the expulsion takes place and so we talked about that in the screencast we don't need to get into that anymore today because we're not going to look at the expulsion this week I just want to look at how historians have viewed the Acadians in that time period how they've try to portray them to us, how they try to understand this story. So basically, to really wrap this down to a nutshell thing, it's about a small group of people, about 15,000 people, who are effectively French peasants, French settlers on the land, and they're kind of caught between the British and the French empires. They're French settlers, but because they're in this kind of territory between the two empires, they're kind of being, it's like Poland between Russia and Germany, they're being marched over all the time. And they're trying to maintain neutrality in that. They're trying to maintain their place in the land, trying not to offend the French, trying not to offend the British. And it's that kind of trying that attempt to try to negotiate a secure place in the land that we're looking at here. And so when we're doing the readings, we want to be looking at how the Acadians view themselves. Mm. We want to look at how outsiders view the Acadians. So who are all the players that we're looking at to yeah. see how they view? 
this is where it gets even messier. And, I, and in the introduction to, these, to the chapter, I, I say explicitly, this is a messy story. There's no doubt that this is a messy story. So who do you want to be looking at? Well, you want to be looking at the Akkadians. And just as a kind of hint on some of these readings, you might be wanting to think about, do these authors actually allow us to see the Akkadians? In other words, some of these authors talk about the British or talk about the French, which goes to your question about who are, who are the players here. But, but of course, that means that we're looking at the British and the French, not the Acadians. In other words, we're not really seeing the Acadians. So you keep that in the back of your mind. But the players, the British Empire, the British forces, the French Empire, the French forces, the French people on the ground, the actual Acadians, their Mi'kmaq neighbors, uh, who, who all live in the same territory together, sometimes in the same villages, not often, but sometimes in the same villages. Um, one of the complicating factors here is the British colonies themselves. As we know, because it's, they don't know this because it hasn't happened yet, but the American Revolution is coming. The American Revolution really marks a, a, an awareness on the part of British, of British and North American people, the people in Massachusetts, the people in Virginia, and so on, that they have power, that they have strength, that they can actually govern themselves and take things into their own hands. In many ways, they're leading the struggle against Acadia, against New France in, in Quebec and Montreal. It's really New Englanders as much as British people doing this. And so it's useful to keep in mind that sometimes the British uh, people and the American people, they're all part of the British Empire at this time, the American Revolution hasn't taken place yet, but they're actually sometimes not acting together. They're sometimes acting separately or on their own in some fashion. So we tend to, in our minds, I think, just think English, French. Uh, but I think that distinction is another one to keep in mind. And you certainly see in these readings, one of these readings in particular, another hint here, really gives you an American perspective on this rather than a British perspective on this. So do, do, would you say that all the historians are looking at the same thing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this chapter is on Mi'kmaq and Acadians, and mostly Acadians, but certainly in that relationship with the Mi'kmaq is critical. Um, but two of them, and I'll just point to the obvious two, the last two, the, the Wiccan piece and the uh, Griffiths piece, they're kind of... And it's interesting, in, in our introductory week, we talked about how historiography is, is really a conversation. It's really about just what we know about things. Um, and uh, Wiccan is really replying to Griffiths. Griffiths writes a, writes a, this is a chapter from a book that she, or no, it's an essay rather, uh, that she writes in the 1980s, I think it is. And she's talking about relationships between the Mi'kmaq and the Acadians. And 30 years later, Bill Wiccan, a later historian, is, is replying to that essay. He's saying something different. He sees something different. So there's those two, I think, are really talking to each other in a way that the other ones maybe aren't. But all three of them are certainly generally ish, dealing with that general issue of relations between the Big Ma and the Acadians and their place in that broader imperial world. I really thought history was just a series of dates and facts. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like all this ambiguity. It makes me uncomfortable. Well, I'm glad to hear that because the real world and real history is ambiguous and it is messy uh, and when we try to reduce things down to really really simple stories we really miss the value and the meaning of them that, for any kind of practical purposes uh, once we make them simple stories they just serve political purposes they don't actually tell us what's going on so even looking at secondary sources are there new ideas that could emerge oh for sure absolutely absolutely um, as the historian trains looking at all the secondary sources allows us to see possibilities but also to imagine new possibilities when you see that an historian is deliberately walking down one road rather than another road you go well what if you had walked down that road or what if she had thought about this and that allows us to ask new questions to look at the evidence with new fresh eyes all the time that's and that's what historiography really is uh, that ability to go back to the sources the primary sources which we're not really doing this week we'll be doing that in later weeks but to go back to those sources and say what do they tell us? What can they, what, what can they tell us about that time period? And look at them to put new, new documents beside each other. What does it mean when we look at that in the context of that, rather than in the context of whatever the other one was? Uh, when you see those in new lights, new perspectives, uh, it allows us to think about them differently. All right, I'm going to go try and read it again. <laughs> Enjoy. Thanks.